the Israelites set out on a long desert journey back to their homeland. God guided them with a pillar of fire at night and a cloud by day. As the Israelites set up camp at the base of Mount Sinai, a dark cloud covered the mountaintop. Thunder boomed and lightning filled the sky. Terrified, the people backed away from the mountain. But Moses climbed up into the dark cloud. The ground began to shake, and God spoke to Moses from a blazing fire on the mountaintop. Here is how my people should live. Don't worship anything but me. Don't misuse or disrespect my name. Set aside a day each week to rest. Honor your parents. Don't murder, steal, or lie. Live purely and faithfully. Don't lust after someone else's spouse or their possessions. When Moses told the people these commands, they said, We'll do everything God said. On the mountaintop, God gave him stone tablets detailing the laws and commands inscribed by God's own finger. When Moses returned to their camp, he found the Israelites in a wild party, worshiping a golden idol they'd made. The people said, we want to follow a God that we can see. Burning with anger, Moses threw the tablets, breaking them into pieces. Then he ground their idol into powder, mixed it with water, and made them drink it. Moses begged God to forgive his people. God said to him, I'm full of compassion and love and slow to get angry. If my people obey my commands, then I'll show my power through them. After giving Moses a new set of tablets, God said, build a special place for me to live among the people I love. So Moses gathered the very best craftsmen and built a sacred tent called a tabernacle in the center of the camp. When God was present inside the tent, a cloud appeared above it during the day and a pillar of fire at night. When the cloud moved, the people followed and continued their long journey back to their homeland. Good morning, everybody. Here we are. Here we are. In the story. In that chapter. In this place. Let me take you back. To 400 years, the Hebrews had lived in foreign, as foreigners in a in, in uh, the land of Egypt, the most culturally and technologically advanced civilization on earth at that time. 400 years. That's a long time. Wow. That's like uh, Pilgrim's Day for us 400 years ago in Jamestown and all of that. Lots happened in, in our world. And, and some of us even know who came over on the boat. You know, if you've investigated that, so you can trace it back to your family 400 years ago. Some, some of you can. Some, some of us only get so far. But uh, that's a long time and a lot of things that happened that we don't really have a lot of details about, about uh, Israel's experience in Egypt. But we know that for the last hundred years or so, their time in Egypt had been bitter with bondage because the Egyptian authorities began to see them as a threat to, to their way of life or, or maybe rise up and, and oppose them. But really what's been going on is that over that period of time, Israel has largely forgotten the God of their father Abraham. They believe that he exists, like many people do, 90% or so would say that today, I believe in God. But they're not so sure, like those 90%, many of those, that God is one who rewards those who diligently seek him. They've had their hope beat out of them, the Israelites have, like people today. And God has become a little more than a memory. But the good news is God remembers them. That's the good news. And through Moses and Aaron, as we've already read, God delivers them with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And through plague after plague, He exposes the powerlessness of the Egyptian gods and their religious system. And in a final divine display, 
Israel witnesses the raw power of God on the shores of the Red Sea. As God opens the path for them and they go through, and then he closes the path on those that were pursuing him. The horse and the driver, he has hurled into the sea, Miriam sang in, in Exodus 15. The Lord reigns forever and ever. What a party. What a celebration. Well, now it's 60 days later. They've made their way from, the, from that shore to the foot of Mount Sinai. And the, now the, the free children of Abraham are there at the very place that God had called Moses years before to go and set my people free. It is here that they will witness something even greater than God's power. They will be invited into the awesome love of the God who keeps covenant with his people. The Apostle Paul reminds us that while prophecies may cease and knowledge will pass away, love never fails. 1 Corinthians 13. We may be all struck by the power of God, but it is His love that keeps us believing and keeps us close. If you took 30 minutes of your day, I hope you will sometime soon, take 30 minutes of your day and just reflect on the formative moments of your life. You come up with a list. There will be people on that list. People that you've known, people that are close to you even now. There'll be places you've been and jobs you've held, and there'll be illnesses and accidents and other surprises and other, we would call, trials that God has used to fashion us into the people we are. For me, that list would also include books, lots of books. I love to read what people have to say about God and, and their experience and, and teachings in, in the Scripture and all of that. And one of those books is Experiencing God by Henry Blackaby. If you've not read it, I hope you'll pick that up. He describes seven realities of experiencing God in, this, in his text. And one of those realities is this, that God pursues a love relationship with you that is real and personal. God pursues a love relationship with you that is real and personal. This is what God has been after since he made us in his image and walked with us in the garden and pursued us when we walked away. For 400 years, the Israelites have witnessed how the Egyptians relate to their gods. There was a God for everything, wasn't there? You know, everything seemed to be manifested, and that's part of what the plagues were about in showing the powerlessness of all the different gods they have. But there was a God for everything. Every God had its specific responsibilities, its specific turf, you might say. And it was your task to keep that God happy and to plead your case for what it is that you might want from that God. You, maybe you want fertile soil. You're getting ready to plant your, your wheat and you want the grain to grow, and so you go to that particular God and you offer a sacrifice. You might be having a baby on the way and, you'll, and you want this baby to be born healthy and happy and everything, and so you, you pursue that and you've got livestock that you want to prosper. Your son might be off in a battle somewhere and you're, you're wanting him to come home, and so you seek that. You want the rain to fall. You want to win a case in court. There's a whole lot of different things that could be going on in your life. And so there was a big system where you would go to the right temple and offer the right sacrifices and, and get the result that you want. And you keep the gods happy and on your side. You gave offerings. You worked deals. Your goal is to placate, pacify, or procure that God's favor. Yahweh, the God of Abraham, wanted his people to know he wasn't like that at all. That is not the way he was with his people. If he didn't help them understand the difference, then they would try and be with him in a way that would lead to frustration, 
despair, and exhaustion. So how could he begin to, to experience, how could he begin to reveal his difference to them? Well, he decides to invite them to a wedding. It's their own wedding. What we have in Exodus is the beginning of a romance story, or actually the continuation of a romance story. Jewish rabbis, even today, have, have long held that the events of Mount Sinai in Exodus were actually a marriage covenant. That's how they view it. A marriage covenant between Lord and Israel. And Jewish ceremonies, then and now, re reenact what happened at Sinai. And they reflect the primary features of God's covenant with Israel. Now, in traditional Jewish culture, the hum there's a human agent who represents the bridegroom in negotiations with potential brides. Sounds pretty cold, doesn't it? Well, we've done different things with getting weddings and marriages happening in our culture. But that person was called the friend of the bridegroom. Now, rabbinic tradition sees Moses as the friend of the bridegroom God used to lead Israel into the marriage covenant with him. Now, the Hebrew word for marriage is ketubah, and it literally means written document. Now, the Jews then and now understand Exodus and the entire Torah as being that written document, that ketubah between God and Israel. Now, God could have used a lot of different images, and he does in different places in the Bible. He could have come to Israel and Mount Sinai as the great judge, and they're the defendant, and, you know, great authority level. And that's, that happens, but not here. Not here. That's not what's going on here. God could have showed up as the, the great king, and Israel is the subject, and there's this power being, being manifested. And that happened to Egypt. God was showing his power to Egypt. Not necessarily here. God could have come simply as the creator, and I made you, and I can take you out. Well, that was Bill Cosby. I'm sorry. The creator, dependence, there's this status thing going on, but that's, that's not what's going on here. Even today, a special ketubah is read in Jewish services at Pentecost, their celebration of the giving of the law. Because the Jews look at all of Israel's history leading up to that point as a bridal history. And the Song of Solomon is read in traditional counting this marriage image. Well, the New Testament also affirms this view of intimate covenant relationship with God. You know, Paul talks about that in Ephesians where he says, Husbands, love your wives as your own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. And just as Christ does the church, because we're all members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. When we get down to Revelation, we read these great words. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Revelation 19. And then he said, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. These are the true words of God. That's what we look forward to in the second coming is a marriage supper of the Lamb. And then finally, one of the seven angels said, Come, here, I will show you the bride the wife of the Lamb. So we've been invited to a wedding. Some of us have been to weddings this year already, haven't we? We've done a lot around here to encourage marriage, to encourage folks as they begin and as they continue and, and as the years pass. And I'd like to take a moment just to, just to ask you to celebrate with me a little bit. Somebody's been here, somebody here today might, might have gotten married this year. Has anybody here today gotten married within the last 12 months? Anybody out there? How about within the last couple of years? Any, any two-year-old marriages out there? Not this guy. Not yet. Anybody been married in the last five years? Okay, I'm, I'm looking for the newest marriage. Four years? Three years? 
Front row, three, three. One. one. Okay, one, one and a half. half. Not, Not quite. quite. Doesn't feel like three yet, yet, does it? Okay, one and a half. Would, Would you guys stand just for a second? second? How about the one? How about the, how about the couple here that's been been together the longest? Anybody been married sixty years? Anybody sixty-five years? Were you the only guys that raised your hand? Were you it? Sixty over sixty? Sixty-two. Would you stand? We honor marriage today. All right, thank you. Now, you guys get with them and give them some clues, okay? Okay. <laughs> God has designed marriage as a covenant. A lot, of things, a lot of things God provides in marriage, you know, intimate affection and enjoyment, unconditional love being expressed, undying commitment being displayed, and new life coming into the world in all the different shapes and forms of that bedrock of our society. Well, the same experience God is saying can be that between me and my people. That intimate affection and enjoyment, that unconditional love and undying commitment and bringing life into the world, this mutual relationship that God desires with each one of us. And so we come to the 19th chapter of Exodus where we find the betrothal. This is where we, we find the betrothal. They've traveled from Egypt. They've crossed the Red Sea. They've gotten into the desert. They've, they've gotten down to the, to the uh, Mount Sinai. And then Moses goes up on the mountain. And, the, and, and he and God have this conversation. And in verse 4, it says, God says, You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words of the Lord had commanded him to speak. All the people all responded together, We will do everything the Lord has said. Out of all the nations... You, you will be my, my treasured possession. possession. Oh, you're every woman in the world to me. You're my fantasy. You're my reality. Exclusivity. He's right there. You are the one of all, of all those I could have. I pick you. An intentional choice, an exclusive choice, a free choice. If you'll obey me fully, And all these blessings, interesting word he picked, fully. The word means wholeheartedly. The word, the word means completely. It does not mean without flaw. It does not, does not mean perfect. It does not mean simply mere compliance. That's not what we want from each other when we are married. We don't want our spouse just to comply. Sounds like the board. You will comply. Much rejoicing and entering into and mutual enjoyment and celebration. And we will do everything the Lord has said, was their response. We do. We're up for it. Well, they thought they were. So we have this betrothal that's coming and this beginning of this relationship. Like, and then the friend of the bridegroom, Moses, is working together and he's bringing the bride and the groom together in this awesome time. Well, well, Moses, Moses goes, goes back, back up on the mountain. mountain. And we have this time of waiting. There's three days. There's lots happens here. There's actually there's lots that's kind of scary here. Clouds and darkness, lightning and thunder, consecration and cleansing. You know, back back in the days, the groom would go away. The, the betrothal would be established. It might be very early. It might even been his kids uh, as they had those arrangements. But, but then, then the groom would go away, and at the right time, after the financial house is in order, then the groom would return, and the bride would be preparing herself for his coming. And that's where that whole story about uh, the, uh, the, the, the wise and foolish virgins that Jesus talked about who had the oil and were waiting, and some uh, didn't have enough oil, and he delayed in waiting. And you know that story about how some got in and, and some didn't get in that way. But they had to wait. There was a separation time, and... 
And uh, that happens often, too, when, you know, people make a decision to, to be married. Usually it's not like two minutes later you're, you're married. There's often this preparation time, and it can feel uh, like a separation. And how many of us have wondered whether or not we're ready for this? When we've, when we've uh, even though even our hearts are beating and our, and our minds are clear mostly, Sometimes people get tired of waiting and take matters into their own hands and things get derailed and like that. But we have this separation time and they're waiting as this, as, as you know, the third day, thunder and lightning and, and you know, prepare yourself and God is coming and the trumpets and all of this. But we do eventually get to the 20th chapter of Exodus and that's where we find those 10 words, those 10 commandments. And they're actually the vows. They're the vows in the wedding, the things that, that, are, that are exchanged uh, with each other in that. I am the Lord, your God. I am. I brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. First vow is exclusivity. You'll have no other gods before me. Not like all that, this stuff you were familiar with in Egypt, where you bounce from one to the other and it's all about getting what you want. This is a relationship of exclusivity that will go on and on and on and be precious in my sight. There's this, there's this vow to, to not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. This is really the, re, the, the refusal to make a God in our own image. It happens all the time. We might not have a, an idol somewhere sitting there, but there's an image in our heart. And this gets marriages in trouble because you know what we sometimes get married to? We get married to our idea of the other instead of the other. And that causes us to get frustrated and even resentful sometimes when the other doesn't fit the image. And that's what happens. God says, don't do that to me. You know, don't, don't, don't equate your knowledge, opinions, or expectations with me. Every time we make an idol, every time we turn to an idol, we settle for something a lot less than the reality. We settle for it. What an awful thing to do when we've been offered so much, to settle for that. So don't, don't, don't equate, don't equate uh, my, your knowledge, opinions, expectations with God. Don't create a God in, in your image. Third thing is, you know, don't misuse the name of the Lord your God. Sometimes we think of that as swearing or blaspheming and that kind of thing and the stuff we hear in too much on the radio and the TV and the movies anymore these days. But really what it's about is improper use of the name of God. Now that's an improper use, but are there other ways we could improperly use God's name? It happens. I call it playing the God card with people how can you argue with that and people do it you know today you know god said this and allah said that and this said this and and a lot of trouble nothing like a good religious fight don't do that you know when people are being sincere and honest that god spoke to me but you know when it feels more like they're just wanting to get what they want done be careful about that don't misuse my name. Don't misuse the family name. It's our name, God says. Don't misuse our name. Don't put our name on stuff that's unworthy. Be careful. And then he says, remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Six days you will labor, do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. This is a promise to make time. A promise to make time with, to be with, not just to be always doing for. Or doing stuff you know to make to make time just to be with one another and not just to do for and that works with God doesn't it as well as with our husbands and our wives you know I'm doing everything to tell you I love you if I never see you we never talk we never sit down and eat that's one person one time said that he had a little survey he says how many how many of you uh, how many times a week does your family sit down and have a meal and someone says Does that clue drive drive through Promise to make time with. These are the kind of people that you need to be, you can be with, with me. And then he goes on in step 5 through 10, and basically it's a commitment to portray God's character to the world because he's saying, you, you will honor your father and mother, you will not murder, you will not commit adultery, 
you, you, you will not steal, you will not bear false witness, you will not covet your neighbor's house and belongings and wife and husband. Because that's the way I am. That's the way I am, God says. I don't do this stuff. Neither will you. Neither must you. You must not do that. Because, because that's the way other people are. This is the way you're going to be. This is, you're going to be different. You're going to be a light shining in the darkness. And that's why he calls us to these high standings, these high callings. Because we're reflecting the character of God. Well, the people get kind of spooked, you know? Nothing like a spooked bride, you know? Oh, Moses says, do not be afraid. God has come. They stayed at a distance and said, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Wow, they know this is important stuff. They don't believe they're ready for such an awesome relationship. Well, God doesn't cut it off and walk away. He said, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. God knows that Israel really has no clue about what he has in mind. I sure didn't know everything that was ahead of me of the last 37 years. And I said, I do. But it's been great. And God has a way of making it great for us. He will have to help them fully engage in this wonderful world-changing covenant. And he does the same for us. Same for us. He will have to believe for them when they cannot believe. He will have to keep faith with them even if they break faith. And like a devoted husband, he will lay his life down. He will lay his life down. Well, what happens next? We have the betrayal, or the betrothal, not the betrayal. We have the betrothal. We have the waiting. We have the vows. And then we do have that sad occasion described in chapter 32 when Moses was on the mountain. The friend of the bride was away up on the mountain, you know, receiving all these instructions about the tabernacle, which we'll come back to in a second. But when they saw that he was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered together with Aaron and said, come make us gods. And we know, we saw that portrayed in our little video there about how they, they did that, and Moses came down, and the, and, and, the, and the judgment that was rendered with all of that. Moses took so long coming down from the mountain. You ever been in the so long times when you're waiting for something good to happen? Waiting for the next movement, waiting for the door to open, waiting for the sign to come. You begin to believe the doubts that rise up in your heart about the, that friend of the bridegroom. Who is this man anyway? We don't know him. He's out of sight and out of mind. They sought comfort in their past experiences. Make us something we can see. Aaron, interesting trying combination. Aaron said, this is your God. And we'll have a festival to the Lord. It's kind of combining what they had just learned with what they used to know, and that became a mess. And they forgot what they were called to become. So much of our life is inspirational. Don't we need to have that call? Call forward? Too many Christians, I think, feel like they're being this. Prodded. When we're being called. I'm heading on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day to higher ground. Well, they forgot what they were called to become. Well, God did not disqualify them because of this failure, even though it was so soon. Though there were consequences, believe me, there always are consequences. But God comes and still does come. He comes today. He comes, he's come to right now. Exodus ends, Exodus ends in chapter 40 with the union. We've had the betrothal. We've had the vow or the separations. We've had the, the vow. We've had even this sad betrayal. When we come to chapter 40, we come to the end of Exodus and we come to this time of union when the tabernacle has been constructed. 
This is the place where God will be among His people. This tabernacle will serve Israel for hundreds of years. We had union with the Father. The Father comes. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. See, what Moses had face to face on the mountain was now in the presence of the whole community. And we have this tabernacle. But that's not all. 1,500 years later, we read this, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, that of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word dwelt among us is the same word tabernacled. Tabernacled with us, dwelt among us in flesh, physical form, and we saw Him, Nathaniel and Philip and Peter and John and James, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, even Nicodemus and old Caiaphas, they saw him. His glory. We have not only union with the Father, but we have union with the Son. And those years when he spent, especially among those 12 men, those 120 that had gathered. And then, that's not all. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, those 120. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house to where they were sitting. And there appeared to each of them tongues of fire resting on them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And Peter stood up with the eleven and addressed the crowd. It shall be in the last days, Peter said, that God says, I will pour my spirit on all mankind, and it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The emphasis there is everyone will be saved. God who came in the tabernacle with one nation in the wilderness at the foot of a mountain comes in the presence of his own son personally in the flesh. And now we see the Holy Spirit coming on the day of Pentecost what, 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 what staging? Isn't God great? The Pentecost day, the celebration, the wedding day. And here we have the wedding day. The Holy Spirit upon all flesh and everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The union, ongoing, day by day. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's not all. Revelation 22, the very last chapter, says, Look, I am coming soon. The Spirit of the Bride, say, Come. The Spirit, God's Spirit, and the Bride, us. We say, Come to the world. Let the one who is thirsty come. You've been invited to the wedding. It's for you. Let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life. It's for you and for you, and for you, and your neighbors, and your co-workers. Everyone's invited to the wedding. Everyone's invited to this relationship with God and his, with his, being His people. I hope you've said, I do, already. I hope every morning you get up, you say, I do. Put your hand in the hand and walk into that new day with the one who knows you best and loves you most. If you haven't done that, you can do that today. That's why we call people to accept Christ and Christian baptism and to rise and walk in newness of life. What a wonderful opportunity. Maybe today, February 1st, wedding day for you.